We are on Ezekiel, last four words of Ezekiel. So that takes you to Ezekiel 48, verse 35. I know I've preached this last four words before. I don't pull out old sermons, and we're going to do it. Got the spoon from the Newmans. Chapter and verse on this flat out spoon. It is cool, man. And I don't like the word cool, but this is cool. I had it marked here for this, and it fell out when I came forward. <laughs> I held Ella the other day at the house. They, uh, 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 she'd come over. I, I don't know how long I held her, but she cried the whole time. Which I'm okay with, man. Crying doesn't bother me, especially babies. What would eventually happen, other than mom and dad lynching me, what would have happened if, uh, if they just left the baby with me? <laughs> she eventually would have what? Well, she would have fallen asleep or gave up crying. And you know what? They realized, oh, that wasn't worth it, you know. That wasn't worth it. And they eventually had to stop crying, you know. And they find out Grandpa's not bad. He's only sort of bad, you know. And, uh, and so on. And kids, kids learn and, and so on. Anyway, I want to preach these last three words. This uh, four words. Uh, this, is, this is my burden, and uh, I want to live to see my burden. The Lord is there. That's what we'll preach today. The Lord is there. And uh, all of us are different, but uh, I, I actually told the wife I was going to take a piece of cardboard, and uh, I was going to, preferably heavy white cardboard, and I was going to write on it, the Lord is there. And I was going to put it on a string or a piece of twine or something and put it around my neck and wear it. The Lord is there. And walk around. And I thought, well, maybe that's kind of tacky. And uh, my brother used to do that. We uh, did work for Cove Manufacturing. Anybody ever hear of Cove Manufacturing? There's a rare guy. Cove Manufacturing. C-O-E. Cove Manufacturing. Painesville, Ohio. And I know the address. I Wrote it out many a time, 609 Bank Street. 609 Bank Street. The largest veneering equipment manufacturer in the world. I believe they had like 300 and some employees at one time. They're gone. Everybody in his uncle's building today. Companies come and go. Maybe the owner died. You know, if there's not the zeal behind it anymore. And then it gets to be push button, computerized, things change. Their calling card actually was a piece of wood. Their, their, the business card was two-ply white pine, I believe. You can veneer that stuff paper thin, and they would crisscross it. You know, you've got one grain going there, one grain going that way. And it would, I mean, you could almost bend that, that business card in half, it won't break. And it's made out of wood. It, it's, it's cool. I mean, what better way to advertise your company than what you produce? Right, as far as a calling card. Hey, think of that with your landscaping company. How could you advertise your company like with a calling card that is made out of uh, grass? grass. <laughs> Mown grass. Something, I mean, that is clever. So anyway, my brother would do this. He would, uh, we would, we uh, engraved all the electronics in, in the controls in there. It's, it's a big deal, folks making gypsum board and plywood, that's a big deal. And they'd have these factories set up where uh, it's, it's a big operation. It goes in, the raw material comes out this way and the uh, plywood's coming out the back end, you know, done, you know, and uh, cooked and all, and, and it, it's a big, big deal. But they're, they're gone. I, we, we drove up there oh, a year or so ago, and there's a chain across in Co. I was tempted to grab that main plate off that chain. It's just abandoned. It's just left there. That buildings are abandoned. They had their own foundry, got a nice tour of the place. Well, we did the executives, and one of the executives' name was Good. I've told this story before G O O D. It was made out of Bakelite. The engraving stock would have been uh, uh, thermal. Thermal setting plastic. Uh, today, folks, all you have in your house is thermal plastic. Thermal plastic. It was 
Years ago, it was all thermal setting plastic. There's a resin in there that hardens it, cannot be reversed. And so uh, it would have been five ply, it could have been five ply plastic, and it was engraved through, and 3M made it. And they, they don't make money, they sell it to the next guy, they keep selling the line off. And originally it was uh, Minnesota Mining, and, but it was good, G-O-O-D, it had two holes, it was hung up on a wrought iron thing from the offices. Well, he'd put a string around that and put it around his neck. And he'd walk around the shop with the word good. And he would show everybody that he was good. And I don't know, I thought it was kind of funny. Hey, you know, when you're at work, you may as well try to have fun, right? And so he would wear that. I, I got thinking about this right now. I don't know if we could do it with a billboard. Uh, what about a, a shirt, a, a business shirt, a t-shirt? And um, where do you want the Lord living? Where? In your, heart. in your heart. And you embroider that on a shirt. Uh, don't they make these fancy machines today? You just type it in on your sewing machine. And I don't mean cheap embroidery, where it's really embroidered nice. They have these commercial machines. I, they probably make them well enough to go into a house today. Where it's, and it would say, the Lord is there. And it would embroider it right on your clothes, right on your blouse. Right where the heart is, the Lord is there. If people, if people put a lot of junk on their shirts, and you can't buy, you want a plain shirt, and you could put on it right at the heart. Hey, do that for me. I'm not afraid to walk around like that. And I wouldn't have been afraid to walk around with a white placard right now that said, the Lord is in word around my neck. And, and have it right there at, the, at your heart saying, the Lord is there. And then put Ezekiel, what is it, 38, 35? I don't know what the address is. 48, 35, something like that. The Lord is there. But that's my burden, is uh, that all of us, and we are all different, that we act as if, and, and in reality, that the Lord is there. Now, folks, this sermon is for you. Not to say, yeah, they, he needs to get right. Ah, it's, it's for you. This is for you to get right. You personally, the Lord is there. Father, bless our message here today and that we would come to the conclusion that as we look in the mirror and we ask ourselves, is the Lord in there? Is the Lord really in our hearts now? In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen and amen. Should I wander around today? Should I stay behind the phone? I don't know. If I wander around, really wander around, I can get that guy. I like giving that guy in doing this. The Lord is there. Tis a great mystery having Christ live in you. That is a mystery that a person is bigger, bigger than the universe. I know, whatever. It could live inside that heart of that guy there. Or this guy here. Or this girl here. Or believe it or not, inside Dana there. You know? <laughs> Am I supposed to say people's names aloud because we're online? I don't know. But I said it anyway. All right. I'm not afraid to be out my I don't care who sees me. Why, why would I hide out? You know, uh, people, people were saying, Oh, no, people are going to log on. They're going to see your sermons. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. You know, uh, it's just a great mystery having Christ live in you. The Bible says that if you're saved. But if we are to believe God's word, we are to believe that Christ lives in us. From the moment we believed, the hope of glory came to make his abode with us. As it is written, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, I guess I'm wandering around to make sure that you pay attention, you know, as the preacher jokes, you know, I, we, we were so poor we couldn't even pay attention, you know. You know, I, I heard that a joke once, and uh, I don't tell jokes when I preach. I try to stay away from that, but some of them are kind of funny. The union between the Christian and Christ is that of a living union. It is the union between the vine and the branches. As our Lord says of our union, 
This union, I am the vine, ye are the branches. That, that's pretty close union, folks. When a person becomes a believer, it is as if a dead branch becomes vitally connected with the vine. And the dead sinner becomes quickened, be made alive, spiritually united with Christ. That this dead thing got put into the live vine and, and it's, it's now alive. Alive. As did Aaron's rod. I mean, we come up with all kinds of illustrations in the Bible. I'd like to use biblical illustrations, not my own dumb inventions, you know. As did Aaron's rod, which abode in the Ark of the Covenant. Now, now listen, when they, when they put, everybody got their own stick, didn't they? Were those live sticks? Were they green? What, what they, uh, they say that there, there's quick in there or whatever it is. Was this a, a, a sort of a live branch that uh, was, still was green? Or was this just a dead stick laying in the yard? Doesn't say, does it? Everybody had to get their own. What did they have to do with that before they stuck it in there? They had to carve their name in there. They had to carve it in there. Right? I don't even know if people could spell our name today. <laughs> It, 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 it's pretty sad out there, folks. You know, education-wise, you know. As did Aaron's rod, which abode in the Ark of the Covenant. For the rod of Aaron had budded, and brought forth bu uh, buds, and bloomed blossoms, and yielded almonds. That is what it's like to be a Christian. If you're placed in the Ark of the Covenant, doesn't that thing represent Jesus, where they, they meet, you know? And... And the mercy seat's there, and, and we're, we're kind of like in Christ there, and, and we're supposed to produce that. Those, this close union is likened unto eating. Now, I, I ate today. Uh, for breakfast, I usually have two slices of toast. Sometimes it's Italian toast, uh, bread. And sometimes it's that artesian, what is it? Artesian bread. Sometimes it's her homemade bread. Sometimes it's, uh, listen, I don't want rye bread. I want hearty Jewish rye. That's what I want. I don't want this pretend American rye. I want hearty Jewish rye. Unger's. Huh? Unger's Bakery. Uh, Unger's Bakery. We want the real deal, you know, and so I have a slice or two of that. But this close union is like an under eating. Eating. Once you eat it, it's pretty well unionized with you, right? Once it goes in there, it, it, it bonds in there. It gets right down there into, into yeah, all right, you want to you let me look at me? Once you, did you have breakfast today? What did you have? Um, cereal. Cereal. Once that cereal went down the hatch, it became part of you down in there. Amen. When one eats, that which is eaten comes into the closest of unions. I mean, it's laying around down in there, broiling around in there. So our Lord says, He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I am him. Now this isn't uh, you know, about the Holy Communion and all that and the Roman Catholic. It's not a sermon man. But folks, you can see the union. Once you eat that, that bagel that you had, it became part of you. <laughs> Right? Who can deny that? And why can't we use an illustration like that? And when he comes to dwell with us, he promises he will never leave us. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Like the eating that was commanded Elijah. We eat. We have Jesus. And we, we, he becomes part of us and we become part. We're, he and us and we and him. Arise and eat because the journey is too great for me. You can't make it on your own. <laughs> he who dwells in Christ and Christ in him is truly united with the fountain of youth for he now possesses what kind of life? Eternal life. Everlasting life. Who was the, who was the one looking for the fountain of youth? Make it Ponce, Ponce de Leon, 
He's down there in Florida poking around the Everglades. He's lucky he didn't get eaten by a crocodile or alligator, you know. Poking around looking for the fountain of life. If list the fountain of youth, if you get saved, you got to find the fountain of youth. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The sinner gives up his own nature and takes on Christ's nature. As blind Bartimaeus. What did blind Bartimaeus do? Pardon? He got up and did what? What did he cast away? His garment. When a, when a baby quits being a baby, these two girls, they drag around, I call it a rag, they drag that rag around. They're going to eventually get rid of that, that rag they dra drag around, right? You, you quit dragging the rag around. My blankie. As blind barred man shed his garment, and he casting away his garment rose and came to Jesus. I ask you, have you cast away your garment? These are the important things to look in the mirror and ask yourself. Have you cast away your garment? He who our Lord healed of blindness, he healed a blind man, what in, in, in uh, John 9, and came seeing what was said of him. What was said of that guy? Is not this he that sat in bed? Some said, this is he, and others said, he is like him. Truly, it could be said of him, the Lord is there. That's our verse, the Lord is there. Because it appeared to be the same person, but man, this guy is different. The Christian is like a city. That's what it says here, the, Ezekiel, the, the end of Ezekiel here, in the, in the name of the city, from here on forever. We're talking about Jerusalem. But we're going to write that, that that's us. The Christian is like a city. The placard written above its entrance reads, the Lord is there. Like as if it were tattooed in your head, forehead. Can that, be said, can that be said of you? Can that be said of you? Or are you as the slothful and the man void of understanding whose city is grown over with thorns and nettles and nettles had covered the face thereof and the stone wall thereof was broken down? You know, in our stone wall, we got these stone walls up at the house. And they're not stone, they're this cultured, it's cultured concrete. But I'm putting all the, all the uh, grandkids' names in there. And it, it's been brought up to me, well, what if someone else moves in there? Well, if dad is dead and I'm six feet under, whoever the new owner is, they can blow the place up. I don't care. What do I care? I've been told, I've been told by relatives, you know what they're going to do to this place? They're just going to bulldoze it and build a high rise here. So I want to put all the grandkids' names in there. And then I want English ivy growing over everything. And once it's all hidden, somebody's going to uh, one day go over it. And a hundred years from now, if the Lord tarries, they're going to look. There's names under here. Today I thought, I'm going to make a, a stainless steel plate. Matthew 18, verse 10. I got a reason for that. Matthew 18, verse 10 is going to go in there too. Boy, we can get to look it up later. You know your Bible, you already know what it says. Or are you like the slothful, the man void of understanding, whose city, that's you, is grown over with thorns and nettles, and covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Lo and behold, when the old nature is cut away, one discovers there is something inscribed upon the heart of the believer. And that inscription reads, the Lord is there. Can that be said of you? Now, you know, I, I think Tucker Landscaping ought to have an official shirt, polo shirt, a V-neck buttoned down to about here, and right over there embroidered, it says, The Lord is there. Live up to it. Nothing more pleasant to be in the presence of a Christian. Uh -uh, I did not like that. Nothing more pleasant to be in the presence of a real Christian. A real. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Why? Why? 
Because the Lord is there. Because the Lord is there. Did you answer the knock at the door? If so, if so, the Lord came in to you and will sup with you and you with him. You know, there's a song that we have. I surrender all. Right, and that's all. But I wrote that down. That's not the song I want. I read this this morning. I said, no, I, did, I, I don't want that. I want the secular song. I surrender, dear. Remember that song? I surrender, dear. Do you remember? You don't remember that? Do you remember? La da 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 da. La da da da. Oh, I played it out, man, at the crown round. La da 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 da. La da 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 da. I surrender, dear. Remember that? Yeah, it's from the 30s. It's from the 30s. I surrender, dear. Well, how I heard that is old. Well, folks, I don't come from the 1930s. <laughs> but how come I know? But I was interested in it. Is surrender a Bible word? Yes. No. Surrender is not a Bible word. It's okay. Surrender is not a Bible word. But we need to surrender our carnal nature to Christ using the weapons of God, amen. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Folks, this is for everybody. Nobody here has arrived. I mean, man, you know, I could be with you for five minutes. I could say, man, we, we, we got we to chip some stuff off of this, you know. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Vengeance is mine. I will, you know, he ain't not a Christian. I'm going to get vengeance. I, uh, vengeance is it yours. Vengeance is mine. I will prepare. Uh, Repay, saith the Lord. And if the Lord is there, he will revenge all that... We're talking about you. You personally. The Lord is there. You're the one sinning. And the Lord will seek revenge on you personally. You. The Christian. If the Lord is there, he will revenge all disobedience. For the next verse reads this. This is the next verse. And having... This is the one about pulling down the strongholds. And having in a readiness... To revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. He seeks revenge there. Revenge. It's kind of like that guy in uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, I think it was Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, I will make your, uh, your house a dung you know? I mean, he was, uh, Bruce Musselman really got off on that in class. He's making everybody's house a dung you know? <laughs> Do you think that if you were to live your life as a lost man, and not as a Christian, there would be a price to pay. And you're a Christian. Do you think, though, if you live your life as a lost man, do you think there would be a price to pay? And, and, and folks, I, I'm not letting anybody off the hook here. Do I have to sit down next to you and get in your face? I'm not going to let anybody get off the hook here. Nobody off the hook. Do you think if you live your life as a lot, you say, well, I can't live in my life as a lost man. Oh, come on, who's kidding who? Do you think that if you were to live your life as a lost man and not as a Christian, there would be a price to pay? Don't you think there would be a price to pay for that? Mm -hmm. To live life as if the Lord were not there, not living in you. When people do wrong, there is a price to pay. And we can find verses to support this. It is like when the children of Israel married strange wives. They were given three days to correct the proud. Three days, man, that, that is long. Now, now, we could tie that in with the three days and the three nights, Jonah. We, I'm sure there's something. There's got to be something with it. There's something with all these numbers. Three days. And that... It, but we, well, days of thousand years. Folks, I'm not giving you 3,000 years to get this done. 
and that whosoever would not come within the three days according to the counsel of the princes and the elders, all his substance should be forfeited, that is a Bible, forfeited, and himself separated from the congregation. Congregation Forfeited is used, guess how many times in the Bible? Hey! Do I hear three, do I hear four? How many times do you think forfeited is used? One time. One time, man. I find those things cool. Forfeit is used only one time in the Bible. And he who has Christ and behaves as if he has not Christ forfeits both rewards as well as reputation. Rewards as well as reputation. And stop thinking that the sermon is for someone else. It is for you. I am the vine and ye are the branches. And the branches are to produce fruit, such as the fruit of the Spirit. When a man loses his temper, uh, we have uh, uh, Esther is uh, what na what do we say Esther is? What nationality? We say she's what? Lati Latino. And Latino, she loses her temper. The other day, she was in the house and, and I said, what's that rumble? It was like that. And, uh, and then I thought, well, maybe Corey's showing her Latino dancing and the flamingo. I mean, she just did that like a drum, you know? That, does Esther lose her temper? See, she loses her temper, right? Where am I here? <laughs> I am the vine, you are the branches, and the branches are to produce fruit, such as the fruit of the Spirit. When a man, and I expect Esther to lose her temper because she's a baby. When a man loses his temper, he could say, my patience has worn thin. Right? When me, my patience has worn thin. There's other phrases for that. Right? My patience has just worn thin. But if he had the fruit of the Spirit, his patience would not wear thin, but his patience would be that of long-suffering Amen. Long-suffering, if the Lord is there. If the Lord is there. When the Lord is there, men live a different life. Wouldn't you like to get up in the morning and say, wouldn't you like to leave this building here today and say, I'm going to live a different life. I'm going to live a different life. You know, lately I've been saying, man, I've been scratching my wife's back for an hour, you know, and she, she scratches mine for... 39 and a half said, I've been itchy late. She, she switched out the fabric softener. We're figuring it out why we're so scratchy. Every time she switches the, the, the detergent, where, you know, it's, I said, what, what did you do? Well, I bought different detergent three weeks ago. Yeah, that's what happens, you know. If that doesn't mean I won't scratch your back. No. <laughs> when the Lord is there, men live a different life, folks. They live a different life. Life now becomes the life of a Christian. I am crucified, the greatest verse for the Christian. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Having the Lord there, is what gave Paul the grace of God to labor more abundantly than others. You know, we might say, well, I, I just, my get up and go has get up and, you know, what, what do they say? My, my got up and went. Well, why don't you let the grace of God take over? I mean, I, I run out of, I run out of, you know, when I run out of gas, what's the best thing I can do? Say it out loud, sister. Go to bed. <laughs> Go to bed. For Paul wrote, it was the Lord which worketh in me mightily, 
which the Lord worketh in me mightily. So Paul could proclaim, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. What is this labor, this mighty work? What is this, this all, all things, all things? How about starting with this? If you are a Christian, then act like a Christian. Then act like a Christian. It is written, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not. Listen, I am going to, I, I plan is, is, within two weeks or three weeks. I'm going to get this board up here. And I'm going to draw a picture in faith where there is no picture. I'm going to do that. I'm going to draw. It's not invisible ink. It's not black lights. It's nothing that anybody, any, oh, well, the evangelist did that for us 13 years ago. It's none of the above of that nonsense. I'm going to draw a picture up there in faith that will not be seen, and my chalk won't even hit the board. And it will not be seen. Not the end of the story. You'll have to come for the sermon to see the rest of the story. And that's the rest of the story. Huh? And act like it is even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. And I want people here that are non-believers, because they will personally see it. You say, How, how's that going to happen? You leave it to Beaver. You leave it to Beaver. I'll make it happen. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. The Spirit dwells in the soul as the sap in the tree. Oh, I know I brought that up. Well, I like to do things that are different. Remember I preached that sermon? I preached, I, I said, that, that, that is enough. I, I decided to preach a sermon and I was all done with my sermon. I said, shake hands before leaving. And everybody looked at me. What? Because I only preached for how long? 10, 15 minutes. Remember that sermon? And then I started my sermon over. Everybody was packing their gear. They were heading out of there. And I preached my sermon over for a second time. There was a reason why I did that. I can't even remember. It must have been the verse. I remember that? I preached it twice. Because most people don't get it the first time. Is Christ in there? The Lord is there? The Spirit dwells in the soul as the sap does in the tree. This is the test of Christian character. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. You know, this is a sermon on comfort, too. For Christ's sake, we are to lead father and mother. It is what makes us orphans. How can we be adopted unless we become an orphan? <laughs> but with Christ, we become the sons of God. <laughs> Amen. Tis a great sorrow to be separated from a loved one, like Mary's sorrow. They have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Rest assured, Christ has come to us. Thus, Christ is ever with his people. The Lord, the Lord is there. Why? Because Christ dwelleth in our hearts by faith. As food in the belly. As sunlight lightens all. You know, you can turn the lights on in your house, but man, as soon as the sun comes up, you know the light is out. As the sap is in the tree, or as the ship is in the sea, the Lord is there. 
as he was when two of his disciples were on their way to a mass. It's going back to what Mary said. You know, where have you taken where where he says right to the Lord. Where have they taken where have you taken? She didn't recognize him. The Lord is there as he was when the two of his disciples were on their way to Emmaus. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. The Savior is a traveling companion willing to accompany us through all our travels. Were the, were the two travelers sorrowful? Were they sorrowful? Yes, yet Christ comes to comfort and to cheer up. We think of Christ as being far off, but in reality, he's quite near. Where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst. When Stephen was stoned, the Lord was there and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. The two on the road, one whose name was Cleopas, just as Mary, as well as others, even though the Lord was there, and, not ha and had not recognized Christ because they only knew Christ as the dying one. Mary didn't know him as the living one then, only as the dying one, the two on the road of Emmaus, only as the dying one, the one suffering on the cross. But when one has impressed upon the mind the resurrection of Christ, those that had Christ recognized Christ. Christ is risen. Can people recognize Christ in you? If one act not like Christ, they cannot see Christ. If one act not like Christ, they cannot see Christ. As John said, there standeth one among you whom ye know not. Jesus is a stranger to so many Christians because so many still walk in the flesh. But Israel, <coughs> which was Jacob, how did Jacob walk? Yeah, now, which leg was it? Was it the right or the left? Right. It was? It doesn't. Huh? Where am I? I don't even know what page I'm in. <laughs> oh, okay. But Israel, which was Jacob, walked not in the flesh, for he hauled it upon his thigh. There's a big blow coming in here. Last time I preached that, there was a big blow coming in there. We had the whole eastern part of the country shut down, if you remember. I preached it in there in the dark. Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the city which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh under this day, because he, the Lord, touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the city that shrank. The flesh is to shrink, and the spirit is to prevail. But too many eat of the city, that is, they forsake not their sinful flesh, but feed their old nature and eat them. Where Israel will not eat that, if they're going to stick with the law. As John said of Christ, he, as John said of Christ, John the Baptist, he must increase, but I must decrease. If Christ represents the new nature, and John represents the old nature, then the character of Christ needs to be manifested in the believer. And the character of the old nature needs to be eradicated. Amen. <clears throat> the Lord is there. That's our title. How does one know? As it says there when Peter preached his ser first sermon, they were pricked in their heart. We only have two pages left. Page of hand. They were pricked in their heart. The word of God is the saving word, which, which is that two-edged sword, piercing. As Christ was born into the, uh, into the world, he was made flesh. So if Christ be born in the heart, he makes the heart a heart of flesh. You know, there's a verse about that. 
<coughs> in Ezekiel, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and will give you a heart of flesh. You know, this new godly heart. The heart of flesh that that of love and compassion, soft so it may take on the stamp of the Spirit, the image of Christ like soft wax, so our Lord may impress upon it. Folks, I don't know about preachers today. I don't think they preach like that, but I preachers for 500 years ago did. <laughs> the old nature is that of the stony heart unwilling to yield. It was Nabal who was such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. For if we be like Christ, if the Lord is there, he will be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Amen? I'll say it again. If the Lord is there, he will be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Whatever is in the heart, does it say the mouth speak it? We're on the last page, brothers and sisters. Maybe you've changed the outside and hidden what really lies within. Ahab rent his clothes. Didn't he? But not his heart. Like the sow that was washed yet returned to her wallowing in the mire. But when one, but when one really has a new heart, they are as was Caleb because he had another spirit. Boy, I'm putting these kids to sleep. Man, that kid is out cold, man. It's okay. When those who see others who are truly changed, and there are Christians who are truly changed, they are amazed at the transformation. Amen. But all that heard, Paul were amazed and said, hearing about Paul, is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem? They were amazed at the change. People every day pay you a visit in one form or another. Every day people, people do. Husbands pay a visit to their wife. Wives pay a visit to their husband. Parents pay a visit to their children. Children pay a visit to their parents. Children pay a visit to each other. We pay a visit to one another. People every day pay you a visit in one form or another. And after their visit, I hope they can truly say of you, the Lord is there. The Lord is there. It would be the greatest of testimonies for any Christian. Best regards to Christ. Six o'clock tonight. <laughs>